Hello, this is Esther Goldenberg, and two of my favorite things are poor painting and drumming. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones, and this is the podcast where we learn about people's favorite things and get recommendations without using an algorithm. Tonight, I am so pleased to be joined by author Esther Goldenberg. Esther is based in D.C., but she's from Chicago, so I think we'll probably get into that a little bit. Her debut novel, The Scrolls of Deborah, is available for pre-order now and will be in your hot little hands in February. So. Esther, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. I am happy to speak with a Chicagoan. Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to get right to that, you know, because you can take a girl out of Chicago, but you can't yeah. take a out of the girl. Yeah. So I have been here. I moved here in 2002 when I was like 26. So I think I live here now. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. It's been yeah. a while. And I'm not going to say exactly what year I left. I'll just say that I left Chicago after high school Mm -hmm. and I haven't lived there since then, but it's always been home, you know? Yeah. And you grew up in Hyde Park? I did. South Side. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I've got one of my very best friends is grew up in Hyde Park. So for High Holy Days, she'll split between, she'll drive down to KM Israel Isaiah, even though she lives in Rogers Park, she'll go down there and stay with her parents and do at least one of the high holy days in Hyde Park and then come back up to the north side where she lives. That's nice. It's hard yeah. to leave. It is. It is. So, Esther, what keeps you busy in DC? Well, I like to call myself an educator because uh, my mom was also an educator. She was mm-hmm. a teacher in Chicago public schools for 40 years. Wow. And I learned by example, even as maybe a 10 year old, I was grading spelling papers. By the time I was 12, I was helping kids with their reading and their math, younger kids. And Mm -hmm. I just always had that model of being in the classroom. And some people are natural. And so I think that was one of my gifts from, you know, above, if you want to say, as well as from my mom. I've been a natural teacher. And to me, calling myself an educator and calling myself a storyteller sort of encompasses everything. Mm. So that is how I keep myself busy is educating and storytelling in combinations of book readings. And I facilitate something called bibliodrama, which is sort of like um, live action role play, but with a B at the beginning for Mm -hmm. Bible. So just all kinds of workshops. And for me, it's a great combination of storytelling and educating and writing and just brings a lot of my loves together. I'm kind of familiar with the bibliodrama. I believe there used to or is still an organization that was storytelling. Ooh, I Maybe. don't know that one, but it sounds worth looking into. Right? Like it was stories, but Torah. So it was storytelling. Mm-hmm. So I know, I know just a bit enough to be dangerous. <laughs> but it's fun, right? Yeah, it's really fun. Yeah, it's really fun. My friend Shifra is doing it right now. I think at Temple Sholem and Lakeview as part of their religious school. So it's nice to see schools also innovating and finding new, I don't, I don't, it's probably not fair to say it's a new way of teaching Torah, right? Like it's right. an oral but tradition. It's interactive. Right. It's not a frontal and it allows for the imagination to explore. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And you have your, your debut novel coming out, The Scrolls of Deborah. Tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, The Scrolls of Deborah. Well, it's biblical fiction. And the Deborah, who's the title character, is Deborah, Rebecca's nursemaid. So there's another Mm -hmm. famous Deborah, the judge. And maybe one day she'll get a book. Um, But this one is about Deborah, Rebecca's nursemaid. She has one verse in the Torah. And that Mm -hmm. verse says that she died and was buried. You know, gives a little bit more specifics about when and where. But that's her whole verse. Mm -hmm. So I was curious about who is this woman who was not talked about at all in the Bible, except that she did get one verse. Why did she get a verse? There are so many Mm -hmm. people who didn't even get the whole verse. She got one, but only telling us that she died and was buried. So I just let my imagination explore that question. And 
through her, the reader gets to see the matriarchs and the patriarchs from her, you know, position amongst them Mm -hmm. and hear some backstories that we're not familiar with from the Bible because those backstories weren't in the Bible. (laughs) Right. Had this Deborah made it into Mishnah, had she made it anywhere? She's got these two verses and the rabbis weren't curious and you got to really go for it. Well, thankfully, after I finished writing the book, I did hear one Midrash that she died on Simchat Torah, Mm. excuse me, Shemini Yatzeret, which, you know, in many places is considered the, the same day. But while I was writing, I deliberately stayed away from other Midrashim because okay. I didn't want to be influenced by what other people thought. And I'm really open to other people having different thoughts and different backstories. I think that's actually a wonderful thing to do is that, you know, everybody can let their imagination guide them mm-hmm. to what it is they want to learn from the story now. And I just wanted to do that. I wanted to let my imagination guide me. And I read the direct stories straight from the book of Genesis. Mm-hmm. And whenever I saw a gap or a curiosity, I would try to fill that in. Mm-hmm. So just to give you one example, when Abraham wants his servant to find a wife for his son, Isaac, the servant goes to Abraham's family in the north and finds Rebecca and brings her back to marry Isaac. And when she first gets a glimpse of Isaac, she falls off her camel. <laughs> and that's what it says right in the yeah. Bible. She falls off her camel. And to me, that's a great opening for why, how, right. what. <laughs> right. So reading the stories in Genesis just gave me all these great questions and gave me the opportunity to make up some answers to it. Amazing. And how I love hearing from authors about the, how long did this story incubate? Did you say, I am ready to write a novel, I'm going to go find a topic, or did this you found this verse and she called to you and the novel started from there? Well, it's kind of an indirect story. The Scrolls of Deborah is the first book in a trilogy called the Desert Songs Trilogy. And it was not the first book that I wrote. Okay. And I didn't know it was going to be a trilogy. So what happened was, let me just say the long story short one it can night. also be long story long. That's okay, cool. what's great Let's about a podcast. So one night in 2018, I was going through a bit of a rough patch in my life. And I was awake in the middle of the night, couldn't go back to sleep. And I reached for my phone to read a book on my phone. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, this will put me right to sleep because it's my phone. You know, it's it's hard to see. It's the middle of the night. I'll just read it for a few minutes and go right back to sleep. And the book that I was reading is called This Messy, Magnificent Life by Janine Roth. And Mm. it's about when basically she and her husband lost everything and how she had to, you know, get her, what would you call it? Her morale back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Things were going to be okay. And in that book, she mentioned that in a certain time period, she had taken X number of breaths. I don't remember the number. And as soon as I read that, it was like in that instant, I had an understanding of Joseph's death, Mm. Joseph from the, from the Bible, you know, and I'm not sure really what the connection is, but I basically just started writing a book about Joseph that I felt like I was scribing it more than writing it really. I just felt like this story was coming through me. I hadn't been planning to write a book about Joseph. I had already written some other books, uh, mostly nonfiction, but Mm -hmm. I really wasn't planning anything. This just came to me. And within six months, I had written a book called 17 Spoons, which is the second book of the trilogy, about Joseph. Mm -hmm. And while writing that, I came to a scene where Joseph and his family came back to the land of Canaan, Joseph and his father, Jacob, and his mother, Rachel, and the whole tribe came back to Canaan and reunited with Isaac and Rebecca. Mm. And at that time, Joseph and the whole tribe also met Deborah, who was mm-hmm. there with Rebecca. And I was so curious, who is this Deborah woman? And in 17 Spoons, she became Joseph's teacher. 
basically, you know, teaching him the ways of the world and how to nurture his gifts. But she's kind of a minor character in that Mm -hmm. book. And I wanted to explore her more because she really fascinated me. Yeah. And so that's how the Scrolls of Deborah came about is because I wanted to find out who she was. And in the Scrolls of Deborah, she tells the reader through Joseph. So Joseph scribes her story for her. Mm. And so it maintains that relationship of her being his teacher. And basically, she teaches him in the Scrolls of Deborah what her life was like. And he writes it down. Okay. Yeah. And this one also took me about six months. Wow. So it was really, I mean, I think that's pretty fast, actually. And when I say six months, that's for That's Russia. very fast. I talked to a lot of authors. It's very fast. Yeah. And that was definitely for the rough draft, you know, and the process mm-hmm. takes a long time. There were several rounds of editing and then there's, you know, going through the whole publication process. So it's been a number of years. Like I said, this started in 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's been a while. But it's exciting to see it now coming into the world. Yeah. And so I'm curious, you said it's a trilogy. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the third book will be? Are you going to see what what feedback you get from readers or? Well, a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. So I've finished writing the second book, as I told you. And the third book is already in progress. Mm -hmm. But it's about... At this time, I'm about one third of the way through it. Okay. So I have, you know, a lot of it written down as well as some ideas, as well as some open space, Mm -hmm. you know, for more ideas to grow. How exciting. Thank you. And the book is currently available for pre-order. Yes. And we'll link to that in the show notes. What is the actual publication date? So people know, because those pre-orders are so important. Mm -hmm. So, so important. So what's the day that everyone listening will have pre-ordered? What's the day they should expect to see it show up in their mailbox? I think it will show up February 21st. So launch date, the release date is February 20th. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things are pretty quick these days. They might have it in their hands by even February 20th, possibly, but if not, then February 21st. And Thank you for pointing out how important those pre-orders are because they really do make a huge difference. Yeah. And word of mouth is so huge also. I don't know if you read the book, The Red Tent. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so do you know that The Red Tent was almost trashed because nobody had heard about it and the publisher was going to just trash it because nobody was buying it. And mm-hmm. Anita Demont got the word out herself through different synagogues and sisterhood groups and book yeah. clubs. And when those readers read the book and loved it and told their friends, it became the book that everybody says, oh, of course I've read The Red Tent. I loved right. it. Now, not everybody has read The Red Tent. And if you know some of your listeners haven't, I can highly recommend it. But with The Scrolls of Deborah, I'm hoping that a lot of people will do the same, that they'll love it and that they'll remember to tell their friends. Mm-hmm. And This book, in my view, is such a tribal book. You know, it really talks about the tribe of the matriarchs and the patriarchs and people living in community. Mm -hmm. And I think it will be a beautiful book for people to discuss with their friends, their family, their communities, because it's such a theme. Yeah, I was actually about to ask if it was because it's set in the same era as The Red Tent. So people who loved that book should come right on over. Exactly. Yeah, I read The Red Tent in, I was living in Colorado. I hadn't converted to Judaism yet. And it wasn't really part of my story of getting to Judaism. It was a book that just went viral around my workplace. I worked at a college on a college campus. I was a hall director. And it just got passed around and all the women on my staff read it. And it was so popular. And I think it was a little bit in part, like this was in the same couple years that vagina monologues was getting really popular. And it was sort of in this set of feminist fiction and nonfiction and books that we were reading at the turn of the century. (laughs) In the olden days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mentioned earlier that I was trying to avoid reading any Midrash about the Mm -hmm. characters. 
And I did read The Red Tent many, many years ago when it came out, and I've deliberately avoided it in you know, recent times because I don't yeah. want to accidentally be influenced by it. And it does overlap, you know, the same characters are in the book. But I think one of the things that I loved the most about that book was just the fact that it existed. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't take anything away from the story. I thought the story was fantastic. I don't remember it vividly right now, but I remember loving the story. But I also remember loving the fact that she did that, that she opened up these possibilities in the backstory. Yeah. To just imagine it another way and or just imagine it deeper, really. It's not even another yeah. way because it's just it's a deeper imagination. And I think that that just opens up so many possibilities, because if you can imagine one variation, then you can just imagine that there are other variations. Right. Right. And and I love that. I love that she did that. Yeah. Outstanding. So the scrolls of Deborah. Everybody's going to pre-order it. You're going to start reading out on February 20th. Are there in-person or virtual launch events that you've got on the calendar? So I've got in-person launch events in DC area in February, and I'm starting to book now. I'm starting to book now things for the book, um, both in-person and virtual. So I can be reached through my website if people want to book me for their book club or their synagogue. I do artist in residence, scholar in residence, pop up mini retreats, all kinds of things. Like I said, my background is in education, not just learning to grade spelling tests for my mom, but I was right. actually a classroom teacher for many years as well. <laughs> well, Esther. The book is what brought us together tonight, but we're also here to talk about some of your favorite things. And you had quite a fun list. So where should we start? Well, I'd like to start with poor painting. Okay. I'm so curious. I, I've, I think I see it sometimes on TikTok. Sometimes it's people using gallons and gallons of paint and sometimes they're using bottles. Sometimes the canvas is spinning. So what does poor painting mean in your life? What does it look like for your practice? Probably not as fancy as what you've seen on TikTok. (laughs) But for me, the physical aspect of it is taking some acrylic paints, putting it in like a cup or a can or something like that, mixing it with glue and maybe a little bit of dish soap, maybe swirling some colors together, and then literally pouring it onto a canvas Mm -hmm. that I have prepared by painting a background color, probably white, sometimes black. I guess I could get more creative one of these days and do a different background (laughs) color, but you know, slowly, slowly. Yeah. So that's the first part of the fun. But then when there's like a puddle of paint on Mm -hmm. the canvas, then I hold the canvas and tilt it in different directions. And it's actually a really slow process. Hmm. And it's really engaging for me and interesting to watch the colors as they slowly slide around on the canvas and mix and swirl together. So I've also seen some tremendous artwork where they like make flowers and mine are not like that at all. (laughs) Mine are really more about the process. But another thing that I love about pore painting is that in my view, the end product always looks nice. Mm -hmm. So I don't consider myself to be a person who has a great deal of artistic talent when it comes to paint. I mean, I can make a pretty good stick figure and a decent rainbow, Mm -hmm. but, you know, in terms of painting a scene or something like that, I haven't really taken classes and I haven't focused on that area. So if I were to draw or paint something, the end result is like, okay. But to pour paint something Mm -hmm. leaves me with a result that I like to look at. Mm. And I'm curious, how were you introduced to pour painting? Well, so for the last three years, I was living in Israel. Mm -hmm. And my Hebrew is pretty strong, but not 100% fluent. And I wanted to do something 
some kind of activity. It didn't need to be art, but I wanted to do something. And I, you know, thought, okay, here's a class that I could join. It was not far away. It was art. I thought it would be great. 12 weeks, we would use different media. Mm -hmm. Well, because of this language gap, it turned out that I accidentally signed myself up for art therapy. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) no, I mean, everybody needs therapy. I mean, everybody needs therapy. Everybody needs art. And, you know, having art therapy certainly enriched my life. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't what I was aiming for. Right. I thought that I was going to get instruction on how to, you know, right make nice looking things you know Mm -hmm. because there are some people who have natural talent and some people who have learned talents and you know certainly the combination some people know how to draw a face or Mm -hmm. an eyeball with shading or make collages with layers I'm just not one of those people and I thought that I would become one of those people to some degree Mm -hmm. through this course that was actually not a course it was art therapy so it was was it was it like group art therapy Yeah, it was group art therapy. It was group art therapy. So I met some wonderful people Mm -hmm. because I don't know. I mean, people who sign themselves up for art therapy on purpose are pretty great. You know, like they're like open minded and creative Mm -hmm. and wanting to improve themselves. So I met some great people, but it wasn't exactly what I was looking for. And I didn't really learn a whole lot of art. And so I started to look at it in my mind as going to Ulpan like Hebrew immersion, Mm -hmm. because I did learn a lot of Hebrew each day. Like each time that I went, I learned a lot of new Hebrew because I like, even though I'm pretty conversant, I don't know a lot of words about art (laughs) and art materials. I mean, I know more now than I did then. But for our Mm -hmm. final project, we got to choose what we wanted to do. So Mm -hmm. after basically eight weeks of expressing my feelings through art that in the end didn't really look beautiful. It was mm-hmm. a nice process, but not a nice product. I decided to do something where I felt like I could have a nice product as well. Yeah. And so with some guidance from the teacher, I chose pouring and it was wonderful. I made four different pieces mm. And each one was focused on one of the elements. So I had air, water, earth, and fire. Mm -hmm. And so each one was primarily one color with some other colors mixed in. And then I decided to take one verse from the Torah and put it on each one. Mm -hmm. Something that went with it. Like for the water, it was like they were standing on the edge of the sea. Mm-hmm. for the crossing of the Red Sea. And at this moment, I don't remember what all of the verses were that I chose. That's all um, right. But it was it was great because, like I said, I got to just watch the paint slowly move. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, especially these days, I don't really like slow down and do almost nothing. But yeah. every time that I do, whether it's staring out the window or going for a walk without earphones, I'm always glad that I did. Yep. And so actually holding the canvas in my hands made me slow down and just watch the paint drip. It right. was amazing. Right. Cause you can't have your phone and be like scrolling. You can't be do- <laughs> doom scrolling in one hand and poor painting in the other. Like you really need to use both hands. Exactly. And be like fully physically engaged in the effort. Totally. Yeah, man. I love that. I love that. Even as a like, sitcom storyline right like (laughs) to accidentally sign up for group therapy instead of group art classes oh yeah (laughs) it's fabulous (laughs) so so you made those four and then did you find an art class that focused on it or did you take what you learned and you started doing it at home or have you continued in pouring So the art therapy is over now and the pouring continues. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I could easily buy the materials for. You know, you just basically need paint and glue. I think you could do it without glue. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I imagine the glue gives it the viscosity to like have some movement. And then the dish soap gives it, well, it depends, I guess, if it's dish soap bubbles or not, but like, because acrylic can be. Like if it's acrylic out of a tube, it doesn't, it's not moving, right? Right. You've got to work on it to make it a liquid with 
that'll move with gravity. So right. The soap, and the soap water, makes sense too. to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I add water too. And so with all of those things, it just, it moves and it, and then it dries. It works. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it works. Magic, I guess, or, yep. you know, divinity, but it's pretty amazing and easy yeah. to do. And if I don't like how it looks, I can always just paint over it because right. you can do that with canvas. And, you know, I'm not like trying to get my pieces in a museum or anything, or mm -hmm. even necessarily on the wall in my home. Although I have some on the wall in my home, yeah. you know, but I'm just saying it's like more about the process. Yeah. And so it's just, it's an easy hobby to have. Yeah. And it's one of the things I, my parents are both artists and we grew up with like unfettered access to grown up art supplies. Wow. Which is pretty, now I realize how special that was. I, I thought it was normal when I was a kid and it's not normal. But my mom was an acrylic artist. She painted in acrylics always. And what I loved about acrylics is that it's so fast. Like it dries and it can be in a, in a matter of hours it's dry. And then you can just gesso over it and go again. The acrylics in particular, you don't have to wait six weeks like you do with oil paints for it to dry. You can really like just be like, all right, it's time to start over. And I like I really always liked that about working in acrylic. That's cool. See, I just don't have the experience to make any kinds of comparisons or anything. And maybe yeah. if you had taught the art therapy, I would have learned a few things about, you know, <laughs> oil painting and acrylic, charcoal. I don't know. Oh, no, I to this day have never used oil paints because I am too impatient. Mm -hmm. It just I, I knew it wouldn't live with my temperament. So, yeah. Good How to know great. these things about yourself. Yeah. And do you work on like canvases that are stretched on a frame or do you buy the canvases that are like on a board what type of canvases are you using or at this point are you using any flat surface in your house no I like to use the ones that are on sale mm -hmm. <laughs> so, that's a great I love that brand yeah I know right yeah <laughs> sometimes they spell the brand name differently even yeah. but but um I always find it anyway yeah so yeah because you know, it's really just for fun. And so I don't know the difference between a good quality canvas and a poor quality canvas. So I'm just having fun with it. I, I like Great. to go for the ones on sale. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And how, how often do you find yourself retreating to your pouring station? You know, it's funny because I'm telling you how much I enjoy it. And I'm telling you the truth because I really enjoy it a lot. Yeah. But I need to sort of make myself do it, right? And then as soon as I make myself do it, then I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to do this more. Mm -hmm. Or like, I don't want to put this down. But how often do I get to it? Probably less than once a week. Yeah. Yeah. It's still a lot more than, than a lot of people are making time to make art. Yeah. How fun. You know, when I look at, sometimes when I look at poor art, like the finished product, there's a level at which it's like almost like reverse marbling. Mm -hmm. Like I, I got to marble paper like once as a kid. Right. And so you make the design in whatever the special ink is and it floats on top of water and then you lay the paper on top of the water and then you pull it up and it has the pattern on it. Cool. But you don't, you don't know what's happening. You hope that what you did of these, these inks floating on top of the water transfer to your paper but like once you put the paper down you can't see what's happening and then it's just a big reveal at the end interesting so so to me like the pour art is pouring it you actually get to see what's happening and you get to make more decisions in the moment about like i'm going to tilt this way or this way i'm going to add another color in right like you get to be it seems like a very active form of art yeah yeah and I've never done marbling, but when you were talking about that, it reminded me of this one time when I was accidentally in art therapy <laughs> and the teacher brought this special paper. It's like, I don't know the name of it. It's kind of a, like a photo paper in a way, but it's all blue mm -hmm. and it reacts in the sun. And yeah. what you do is like put twigs or leaves or flowers or something on the paper and then you put glass or maybe it's plexiglass or plastic I don't know on top of it you let it be in the sunshine for a few minutes and then you take it out and you rinse it in water and it leaves the negative mm -hmm. of what was on there and that was a very cool process to watch and be a part of but still very different from pouring because 
once it's done, it's done. Right. Yeah. I have played with that paper too. in like a photography class, I think as we were getting up to photo, like darkroom photo printing, because part of experimenting with that paper is, you know, you, you can start with everything on it and then you pull items off and you can start to get some depth based on like how long they were blocking the sun from the paper. So then you can get like shades of blue on it. And, you know, if you're a very methodical thinker, you know, you can really, mine were not, I, I remember buying a lot of like hair gel from the Dollar Tree. So I'd put gel on the glass on top of the paper. So it would be like a really, it so it would have the shadows of like plops of hair gel. Cool. Yeah. I didn't remember that at all. That just <laughs> unearthed the college memory. But yeah. That's what happens in art therapy, you know? Yeah. Great. Is there anything about poor painting that I haven't asked you that you would be sad not to mention? I don't think so. Like I said, I'm not really an expert. I just enjoy it. Great. So, yeah. I mean, I always put down a drop cloth. That's an important piece of it. That's smart. Yeah, I didn't mention that before. Yeah. Protect your clothes, protect your furniture, protect your floor. Yeah. At this point, do you have your painting clothes? Where all clothes are painting clothes. I've actually been okay with the painting clothes. I have like an apron, Mm -hmm. but I try to wear short sleeves. Yeah. And then just, you know, I sort of like lean over the drop cloth. Yeah. So my body isn't so close to it. So far, I've been okay. The other great thing about acrylics is it just, it's very, you let it dry and you can just peel it right off. That is a bonus. So Esther, the other thing you mentioned that you was not in your original email, but you mentioned right before we hit record is drumming. Yes, I do love drumming. Tell me everything. Okay. Well, there are so many things to love about drumming. I started, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. And like with poor painting, I Mm -hmm. don't drum all the time, but all the time that I drum, I love it. Yeah. And I just today also noticed another similarity between drumming and poor painting. And it's actually that there's a lot of leeway for what you do during the activity. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of leeway during the pouring and it always turns out really cool. Yeah. And there's a lot of leeway in drumming and it always turns out pretty cool. I mean, you could mess up either one for sure. But with drumming, you know, like sometimes I could lose the rhythm or whatever. I often drum with other people. So are we talking like a djembe, an African drum? Are we talking a drum set? Are we talking bongos, tambourines? What is in the universe of drumming for you? Such a good question. This is probably why you're the podcaster. (laughs) Djembe. It's djembe all the way. So big African drum. Yeah. Great sounds whether solo or in a group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just love the way that it sounds and I love the rhythm and I love that I can just get lost in it. It's another thing that you can't do while holding a phone actually. Absolutely. You know, you can't, you can't drum while doing anything else. Mm -hmm. And so it really brings me into it, you know, like you can feel it through your whole body and I love that so much. And I love the repetition too. Like I'm the yeah. type of person who can listen to a song that I love on repeat. So if I can do a rhythm on the djembe for like 20 minutes, yep. I'm happy just repeating. Yeah. So I, I was active in drum circles when I lived in Colorado. And I would say drum circles were a part of my path to Judaism. Absolutely. Our teacher, Kulu, was definitely Jewish. <laughs> You know, Kulu was his drumming name. And I I don't know that I can, I can't draw a straight line from it, but it was, it was definitely for me, one of the first times I found community that was like outside of school, outside of work, that was meditative. And you could just let it, you know, he would kind of be like, all right, here's, here's the rhythm you're gonna, this is what you're gonna do. And you just go and you would go for 20 minutes and and just be completely lost in it. And it was fabulous. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. That's exactly how I felt about it. And 
Actually, in the scrolls of Deborah, there's a lot about women drumming in mm-hmm. circles because it can be such a beautiful communal activity yeah. and uplifting and just wonderful. It can sweep you away in a good way, mm-hmm. in my experience. And how did you come to find a drumming? Well, I actually found it at a time when I had pretty limited time windows to do anything. Mm -hmm. And there was drumming near me at a time that I could go and I went. Amazing. And yeah, yeah, there's an amazing teacher locally here. Her name's Kristen. And I have been going to drumming circles with her on and off for um, more than 15, probably close to 20 years at this Mm -hmm. point. And there have been different times when I've gone every Sunday and there Mm -hmm. have been times when I haven't been able to make it. And there have been times when I haven't lived locally, so I haven't gone. Yeah. And then there was COVID. So, you know, through all these things, though, there has been drumming. Yeah. The other thing that I love about the drum, in addition to the music, and I hope you don't mind me circling back to the book here, but this is... You are allowed This is not... Oh, good. (laughs) So... You might remember when the children of Israel crossed the sea mm-hmm. and then they were safe from Pharaoh and Miriam took up her drum and the women took up their drums and followed after her and they all, you know, played their drums and sang, right? Mm-hmm. And I've always loved this part of the story because in order to be able to do that, it meant that they took their drums with them. Hmm. So when they were packing to leave Egypt and they needed to hightail it out of there and they'd been waiting to get out of this rough time. And by the way, even getting out of the rough time was rough. Right. They brought their instruments of joy and celebration with them in the hopes and with the foresight that there would be cause to celebrate again and then they would be ready. Wow. I have never... We spend so much time talking about, you know, why we eat flatbread, right? Why do we eat matzah? Because they fled before the bread had time to rise. And all we ever talk about is the unrisen bread. We don't ever talk about anything else they packed. And it's literally never occurred to me that like they didn't have a pile of drums waiting on the other side of the Red Sea, right? They didn't. There wasn't a market there (laughs) where they stopped and bought them. Truly have never considered anything other than the matzah. Yeah, because that's the story that you were told. With no offense to anybody, that's just the story that you were told. Right. And so I love opening the story up more. Like Mm -hmm. to look around in the, you know, peripheral vision almost of the scene and what was going on and to just pause and say, hey. They were drumming in celebration, but where'd they get those drums from? Right. There wasn't a market. I mean, somebody else could do a story and in their story, they could say, oh yeah, there must've been a market on the other side of the Red Sea. Go for it. Right. Go for it. Tell that story. But for me, it was, they were leaving and they were going to need to celebrate someday. And so would they do that? They needed to pack their drums. Even when it was a hard time, it wasn't going to be permanently a hard time. And when it was going to be good, they were going to be ready. Yeah. Huh. I, I, I just, you truly have just blown my mind. Thank you. You know, we sing, I, I'm a, I'm active in a reform synagogue. We, you know, we sing Debbie Friedman and, you know, and the women mm-hmm. dancing with their timbrels. We sing it like at least once a month mm-hmm. during Shabbat services. And, you know, right. It's an emergency. You've got to pack. What are you going to pack? What's going to, what are the things that you're going to take with you in your bundle? into your new life when you quickly Mm -hmm. pack you know i I think in the modern world we people will do the thought experiment of like if your house is on fire what do you grab Mm -hmm. and i just never thought about anything other than the matzah so you found drumming 15 years ago you found a local teacher Mm -hmm. when in these last three years in israel did is your djembe something that you took with you across the sea So I am lucky enough to have more than one djembe, Mm -hmm. and I entrusted two djembes to good friends in America, and I Mm -hmm. took one across the sea to Israel. And I actually did that thought experiment about, you know, if you have to leave in a rush, what will you take? It wasn't so much a thought experiment as an actual thing that happened when the war broke out. Yeah. 
It was a very difficult decision to make, Mm -hmm. much to my own surprise. It sounds easy, like if there's a war zone, should you stay in the war zone or leave the war zone? Sounds almost like an easy question with an easy answer. It was really difficult. Yeah. And in the end, I did leave and I did not take my drum. And this was a difficult decision. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of factors, you know, in the decision making. And for right now, what I'm reminding myself of is that I am so lucky to have drums in America and drums in Israel. Mm -hmm. So I can travel without my drums and still have them wherever I'm going to be. Yeah, that's a really powerful way to frame it. Yeah, yeah. Because like I was saying, the drum, I mean, I love the act of drumming, but it's also hugely symbolic to me Mm -hmm. about the joy and the women who packed the drums, you know, on their way out of Egypt is a story that I have been aware of, mm-hmm. you know, even if it's one that I told myself <laughs> for for some time now. Yeah. And so when it was time to go, it really was a question for me, like, should I take the drum? And just for practical matters, it, it didn't make sense. And so the drum has that joyful meaning for me, mm-hmm. but also a lot of symbolism. Yeah. Yeah. I had a a lot of friends who had, uh, you know, some who were there on a year with their family, trying to decide, stay or go. So some people came back, some people stayed, some people came back briefly and have returned. It's the whole, it's run the whole gamut of people making that decision. And I do not envy anyone who has had to make that decision. I, I, I don't think it's anyone who thinks it was an easy decision i guess doesn't know anyone there yeah possibly yeah (laughs) yeah and have you been able to return to your dc drum circle since you've been back i thought i was going to i actually was back for about a week or a week and a half i don't remember when i sent an email to Kristen saying hey are you still meeting up on sundays and she said yes yes come and it turned out that i just couldn't handle it yet Mm -hmm. so i haven't been back yet yeah. It's been more than a week at this point, but just the resettling process has taken more time and more energy than I anticipated. Yeah. And right now I'm in an apartment, so I have not reclaimed my djembe's because I feel like my neighbors would not appreciate that. Mm-hmm. To build those relationships a little bit stronger before they find out you're the neighbor who has a drum. Exactly, exactly. So I am going to keep my drumming to be just in the drumming circle. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope to get back there soon. My sister, uh, my twin sister, a couple years ago for Christmas got a drum set because she was like, I want to take up, I want to be louder. I want to learn to like be louder as a woman in the world. And so she got a drum set and she took like Zoom drum lessons with a, a friend we went to college with who was a drum teacher. And yeah. And so she's in her basement drumming on a drum set that's really amazing yeah and had a lot of fun doing it and then she noticed it was impacting her hearing and she was like maybe i will take a pause (laughs) but one of her sons who plays trombone also has been sneaking onto her drum set to he wants to be the pep band drummer interesting Mm -hmm. well one thing i can tell you poor painting is not loud at all right (laughs) <laughs> so you can maintain your civil relationships with your neighbors you can maintain your hearing mm-hmm. there are a lot of great benefits but other than what i said before about the similarity of enjoying the process and having a great end product no matter what other than that they feel a little bit opposite you know the loud rhythmic right. drumming and the quiet meditative poor painting yeah so I want to ask you briefly, you had one other thing mentioned in your email, and that was that you also are an avid audiobook listener. Yes. And that you get your a lot of your reading in through listening. Yes. So I guess my first question, is there going to be an audiobook for your book? There is going to be an audiobook. I'm so excited about that. I get most of my books through the library app Mm -hmm. on audio. That's probably like 90% of my book consumption Mm -hmm. is through the library app on audio. So I'm very excited to see my own book be available in that way. 
And I've recently connected with the actor who's reading the book cool. and the producer who's producing the audiobook. And the first level is finished. I don't exactly know what that means, yeah. but it's going to be released on February 20th, just like the print version. Outstanding. Yeah, That's I'm really so exciting. excited. Yeah. And when for you, did you realize that audio was your preferred way to consume books? You know, it's funny because I'm an author who doesn't really like to read. Mm -hmm. And not liking to read is something that goes way back, (laughs) like to to when I learned how to read. And even in elementary school, I knew that I had some eye muscle struggles. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have trouble with decoding and I don't have trouble with decoding, but I do have trouble with tracking and Mm. I'm a very slow reader. So for me to read a book just takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. Yeah. And it's got to be a book that's really worth it. And I have read a few books that weren't available on audio that were really worth it. But at this point, I'm reading about two or three books a year that I'm actually holding in my hands, paper Mm -hmm. book, reading. And when I was a kid, I thought that I didn't like books, Mm -hmm. but it turned out I just didn't like reading. Yeah. And the books themselves are great. Yeah. And I told you my mom was a teacher and she used to read aloud. Mm -hmm. And I loved that. Yeah. And my dad would always make up stories and I would hear him telling stories. And I loved that too. Yeah. But I just had so much struggle when I was reading that I just pinned that on books and thought books were terrible. Yeah. And it took me really until young adulthood to realize that actually books are pretty good. It's just that it's it's hard work. It's it's like working out at a gym or something, right. but for my eyes. And so I just didn't want to put in the effort. And I think it's been about five or six years now since I discovered apps where you can listen to mm-hmm. books. You know, a long time ago, a friend loaned me a book on CDs. Yeah. And I think that was the first time that I ever actually heard an audiobook, you know, that was produced that way. I knew that books on tape existed. I just right. hadn't heard them, you know. And it was great. And now when I listen on an audiobook, I can actually speed it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And some people, people who are fast readers, they get to read a book quickly. I don't get to read a book quickly because I'm such a slow reader, but I yeah. do get to listen to a book quickly. Mm-hmm. And I don't make it uncomfortably fast for myself, but I get to speed it up so that I can get through it in a reasonable amount of time and still enjoy hearing the story, hearing mm-hmm. the reader. What have been some of your favorite reads in the last couple of years? Are there some? I'm curious, do you, are there voice actors? that you love so much that you'll listen to any books that they record? Or have you gotten to a place where you prefer, I don't know, do you prefer like women reading the books over men? Or or is it just you've heard this author has a great book and you want to dive into it? I haven't exactly found what I like in terms of the reader, but Mm -hmm. I have found what I struggle with in terms of the reader. So if the reader has a strong accent, not necessarily a foreign accent, but they might be like putting on an accent in order to read the book to make mm-hmm. it sound a certain way. That makes it just harder for me to listen to. And mm-hmm. I've decided there are so many books available that if a book is, you know, hard for me to listen to more difficult than it is fun, yeah. then I put that one aside. So usually what I like is that I sort of just disappear into the book, you know, mm-hmm. and I don't really notice that the author is using different voices or different intonations for different characters. They do, you know, because they're professional, but I don't really even notice it right away until maybe a new character comes on and I'm like, oh, they used a different voice. That's Mm -hmm. cool, you know? And so I've noticed that well-produced fiction books are great. The nonfiction are often read by the authors themselves. Yeah. But I haven't read anything where I've been turned off by the nonfiction author reading their own book. They generally, you know, they're so familiar with it and so Mm -hmm. passionate about whatever it is that I tend to find that they're good readers for their books. Yeah. I recently listened to Maria Bamford's memoir. I think it's okay. I'll join your cult. Fine. I'll join (laughs) your cult. That's on my list. How was it? Oh, so good. So good. She does. I don't know if you've ever gone to see her do stand up comedy, but she does tons of act outs and voices and 
So when she does the voices in the book, when she does her mom's dialogue or anybody else's dialogue with her, it is completely new characters. And then she also did audio, like audio marks. She's like, look, you can't see that this is a recipe card. So she also, there's like three or four audio marks in the book that would have been illustrations or something in the print book that are really fun. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Well, I look forward to it coming up in my queue because yeah. I think I have about a three week wait on that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's outstanding. I found it. Um, She's such a compelling storyteller and she's so her facility with characters is just off the charts. I enjoy listening to comedian memoirs, comedy memoirs read by the comedian, but hers is the best, just the top, the best. Oh, that's exciting. I look yeah. forward to that. I really love listening to David Sedaris mm -hmm. and I can laugh out loud at his book. And yeah. have you listened to Jenny Lawson's books? Oh, the bloggers? Yeah. I haven't. Does she record them? She records them. And I just feel like she's just telling me the story of what yeah. happened, you know, and it's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. I did not know her, but in the early days of blogging and blog her, like, so I, I knew her before, you know, we were, we circled the same anxiety couches at large conferences. <laughs> <laughs> we hid in the same, in, in similar bathroom stalls. How about that? There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And she's got like, she opened a bookstore, didn't she? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. She should invite me to come do a reading there. Jenny, are you listening? Yeah. I could come read the Scrolls of Deborah at your bookstore. That would be amazing. She's yeah. lovely. I can tell from her books. It yeah. feels like she's telling me her stories. Yeah. How fun. The one with the giant metal chicken. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, every single one. They're just mm -hmm. like, they're just absolutely hilarious. Mm -hmm. And I love the authenticity of it too. You know, yes. it's, it's so funny because she's so vulnerable in her shares mm -hmm. and you know, it's just all true. And she lived through it. And yeah. it's great that she's on the other side now. We get to yeah. laugh with her. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. Well, Esther, this has been a delight. It's been so good to get to know you. I am thrilled that you reached out and pitched yourself to come on the podcast. Well, I'm thrilled that you invited me on to yeah. have this great conversation. This is really fun. And I told you before, I've listened to your other episodes and I just love the concept. You know, I mean, the conversations are fantastic too, but I love the idea that you're just talking to people about what they love. You know, we get asked it's like socially acceptable to talk about love stories and work histories and other than that like those are you know oh what do you do how did what what did you study They're, those are the how did you meet how's your dating going like those are the conversations we tend to have but everybody loves something and it's nice to like dive into it with people you know the problem for me is the number of hobbies that i it's an expensive because I want to <laughs> pick up, you know, I have some fountain pens now. I've, I've watched new shows. I have, there are definitely things I have tried because people are so passionate when we talk about it. That's really cool. Yeah. So the scrolls of Deborah available for pre-order now published date, February 20th, 2024, the first of a trilogy. So get in early Esther, where can people find you online? Best place is estergoldenberg.com. And I'm on social media a little bit, but if I do anything interesting, I'll send you an email, you know, if you sign up for my list at estergoldenberg.com. And if I don't do anything interesting, I won't email you. So <laughs> I'm not one of those people who sends out an email every five minutes, but, you know, I'll tell you when the book tour is coming to your neighborhood and then we could meet up and play the drums together or just do some poor painting or bibliodrama. You know, but other than that, I don't have a lot to bother you about in email. So the best place is always estergoldenberg.com. And I'm really excited that The Scrolls of Deborah is coming out in just a few weeks. But I'll tell you, 17 Spoons is coming out just after that, a year later. So it is Great. worthwhile to sign up for the newsletter because you'll find out as soon as 17 Spoons is available. There are already people who have pre-read The Scrolls of Deborah, like mm -hmm. the early readers. And they're like, I can't wait for 17 Spoons. So 
not 100% of the readers are going to feel that way because every reader likes a different book and that's fine. But yeah. if you're somebody who does like The Scrolls of Deborah, it's going to be worth it to find out when 17th Moon is coming out. Yeah. And you should hire Esther for coming to your synagogue to be an artist in resident, come to your community, have her come to your book club, your Zoom book clubs, have her Zoom in. So get in touch with Esther, get on her calendar. This was a blast. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.